Timeless Leadership is brought to you in part by Gemography. Get matched with pre-vetted remote developers your business can count on. Discover how at gemography.com slash hire. Trusted by over 200 companies. That's gemography.com slash hire. As he looks at the current challenges with media, Jeff Jarvis wants us to look at the past in order to understand our present. It starts to look familiar like the age before Gutenberg. We're returning to a conversational era. Knowledge is once again passed around click by click and changed along the way. There's less of a sense of ownership or authorship of this thing we called content. That's why we're fighting over copyright. And so it's really interesting to look at that period of history to try to learn what was it that print meant to us as a society? What presumptions did it bring? But more to the point, Scott, what lessons might we learn from society's entry into the age of print as we now leave it for whatever follows? And that's what fascinated me. Join us now for a look at the Gutenberg Parenthesis, as Jeff Jarvis traces the epic of print from its fateful beginnings to our digital present and draws out lessons for the age to come. This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore what makes extraordinary people tick. We look for the universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Humans weren't designed to read and write. We're a speaking species. But for five centuries, the epic of print shaped our worldview, gave us completeness and permanence and authority in the printed word. As a technology, at the beginning, print was as disruptive as the digital migration of today. And now, as the internet ushers us past the culture of print, Jeff Jarvis offers important lessons from the era that we leave behind. To understand our transition out of the Gutenberg age, we're going to talk with Jeff about examining the transition into it, how the Western industrialized world used print and its invention and evolution to power entire countries and religions and how print gave rise to the idea of mass media and mass markets and mass culture and mass politics and so on. This idea that we can somehow be unified in the public sphere. And what can we learn from this captivating history of our devotion to print. Could it be that we're returning to a time before mass media, to a society built on conversation? And maybe we're relearning how to have conversations with ourselves. We certainly are struggling with it online. So join us now as Jeff Jarvis takes us on this fascinating journey through the Gutenberg Parenthesis. Jeff Jarvis holds the Leonard Toe Chair in Journalism Innovation and directs the Toe Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City University of New York's Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. He was creator and founding managing editor of Entertainment Weekly, TV critic for TV Guide and People, Sunday editor of the New York Daily News, a media columnist for The Guardian, and President and Creative Director of Advance.net. He blogs at buzzmachine.com, co-hosts the podcast This Week in Google, and is author of five books, including What Would Google Do? Public Parts, How Sharing the Digital Age Improves the Way We Work and Live, Geeks Bearing Gifts, Imagining New Futures for News, and now, The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Jeff Jarvis, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. It's great to talk to you. 
Well, you know, I was fascinated by uh, your book, just looking at the title, The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Um, that alone was arresting because I have kind of an amateur's eye for history. But uh, I, I wondered if we might start with just defining what exactly the Gutenberg parenthesis is. It's a phrase I've heard before, but I don't know that uh, for many people it's really been well defined. The idea which captivated me actually comes from three academics at the University of Southern Denmark. One of them came to MIT some years ago and gave a talk about this idea. And it is that Gutenberg's years, the years of print, were an exception in history. And that before print, ideas were passed along mouth to mouth and changed along the way. Um, and there was really no sense of ownership or authorship of, of text. Uh, the business model was that scribes uh, got a patron and spent a long time rewriting books. Then we come to the Gutenberg years and things change pretty markedly. Our cognition of the world changes. As, as Marshall McLuhan would say, the line in this sentence became our organizing principle. Things became packaged. They had a beginning and an end. They were part of, a, of, of the book, the publication. We got a business model for, for publications long after Gutenberg in 1700 with copyright. And um, our sense of, of, of authority changed. It describes it was the ancients, but in the age of books, it's Frau Doctor Professor so and so who writes a book, and then now say these scholars uh, led by a guy named Tom Pettit, after Gutenberg, which is to say now, and I'm not saying books are going to die, I'm not saying print's going to die, but but as we as we leave the age of print for the age of the internet, the connected world, the world of data, uh, what Tom Pettit and company said is that it starts to look familiar like the age before Gutenberg. We're returning to a conversational era. Knowledge is once again passed around click by click and changed along the way. There's less of a sense of ownership or authorship of this thing we called content. That's why we're fighting over copyright. And so it's really interesting to look at that period of history to try to learn what was it that print meant to us as a society. What presumptions did it bring? But more to the point, Scott, what lessons might we learn from society's entry into the age of print as we now leave it for whatever follows? And that's what fascinated me. This sings to me, Jeff, because I've been writing the timeless and timely leadership for a number of years now to kind of undergird the importance of looking at historical figures, historical happenings, etc. And to put a lens on the present world, because as you know, humans are constant in our behavior. Uh, <laughs> yes. and, and we see these cycles repeated over and over. And yet people just throw out uh, these examples from history because they think, oh, it doesn't apply today. Technology is so different. Things are so markedly uh, expanding. And yet, I, I love this in, in your, your book, you mentioned that in Gutenberg years, <laughs> where we are in the evolution here, we're at about, uh, I think, 1480. Right. How does, that, how does that fit in the former timeline, and how does that apply in the current timeline? What really struck me, Scott, about, about the history of print is how long it took. About 1454, the Bible comes off the press, and it took another 50 years, a half a century, before the book as we know it take the form that we know today with things like titles and title pages and page numbers and indices and so on. It wasn't until 1600, another century on, that we saw a, a huge rush of innovation with print. The technology by then was boring. But then we saw Cervantes invent the modern novel, Montaigne invent the essay, Shakespeare show the possibility for a market for printed books and the invention of the newspaper all within a few years of the year 1600. Fast forward another century to 1710, we get the Statute of Anne, which is the beginning of copyright. Fast forward to 1800, another century, is the first time you see really any notable change in the technology of print with steam-powered printing and stereotyping and at the end of the century, the linotype. Um, Fast forward now to the 1920s, you get the first competitor to print, which is radio, in addition to film. And then we get to 1950s and television, and then here we are today with the internet. And what did I leave out of that? Well, of course, the internet. We're only about a quarter century away from the introduction of the commercial browser, which I mark as the popular internet. 
in 94. That's why I think that we're really at about 1480 in Gutenberg years. And people think we're going through tremendously fast change now. I ask, what if actually the change is slow and just beginning? I, I think it's really worth uh, considering. And, you know, there was a, a quote from McLuhan you actually included in your book he, where he said, our age of anxiety is in great part the result of trying to do today's job with yesterday's tools and with yesterday's concepts. And that really spoke to me because it, it seems like too often we're, we're focused on this, you know, this uncertainty, this uh, increasing um, mode of change that we're seeing, and everyone's all wrapped up in it. And yet, we haven't really paused to say, well, are, are we really evolving our concepts, our thoughts, our approaches concurrent with the technology? Or are we simply doing the same thing over and over again, simply with new technology? In other words, you know, when television came along, it was simply radio with pictures. And, and we, were very, we weren't very creative in our approach. And we're falling into that same trap again and again. I, I think you're, you're exactly right. The, the incredibly quotable McLuhan also said that each new medium uses the previous medium as its content. And so if you look at the internet, magazines and newspapers are pretty much recognizable as magazines and newspapers online. And I teach journalism and I want to get students to radically rethink what media and journalism can be and should be. But we, we obviously go to the analog that we know. And, and I'm old enough uh, that, that it's a hard habit to break. But I think we will see in time tremendous innovation in reimagining what the net can be. That's not to say that we abandon everything that came before. I wrote a book some years ago called What Would Google Do? in which I said the book should be updated and it should be searchable and linkable and clickable. In this book, in the Gutenberg parenthesis, I recant all of that. I think the book is an institution that uh, we can judge ourselves against. And, and what we really have to do in this new age is decide about our institutions. Which institutions do we support, like books and libraries? Which institutions do we update, like education? Which institutions do we reject, maybe copyright? Um, we are in a time of change. You were right at the very beginning of our conversation that humans are a constant and our behavior is a constant. But we have new opportunities that we can plumb only when we can try to see them for what they are, which is new. Absolutely. Um, and and I want to uh, stick the landing there on the institutional discussion there because, uh, as you say in the book, institutions are human-created. None, none of these uh, are, are in existence without our um, organizational approach. And, and they're, they're artifices. They're, 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 they're something that we simply created to manage uh, whether it's a flow of information or a process or a group of people, et cetera. Um, but when we think about information, and particularly disinformation and misinformation, which has gotten a lot of press over the last few years, um, in some cases, when institutions have inserted themselves in the process as a way to approach a kind of um, let's just call it a mass definition for how a certain set of facts or uh, data should be interpreted. Oftentimes, these institutions have gummed it up rather than clarified it. You know, we see Twitter and, you know, what's happened there. We see Facebook and its approach to uh, election misinformation. What do you think the future will look like? Will it all be uh, user defined or human defined or where are we going? So as is my habit now, and like you, I'll, I'll look to the past first to try to imagine the future because I, I, I don't think there's such a thing as a futurist, really. We're, we're all going to be guessing. But I look to the past. One of my favorite anecdotes from the Gutenberg parenthesis is that uh, a, a Latin translator, a scholar named Niccolo Perotti, uh, wrote what is said to be the first call for censorship in 1470, coming not long after the Bible in 1454. And he was much offended by a shoddy translation of Pliny. And he wrote directly to the Pope and said, you must appoint a censor to approve these forms before they get printed, someone of erudition and intelligence. And I thought about it, and I realized he wasn't asking for censorship at all. What he was seeking or anticipating 
was the creation of the institutions of editing and publishing, which would in time come and would for a long time, for a half a millennium, assure some good level of authority, quality, artistry in print. And those institutions were terribly valuable to us, but today they're rather inadequate to the scale of speech that we have now. And the first reflex when you have a new mechanism that allows more people to be heard is to resist, especially those who held those mechanisms before. Uh, People like me who worked in newspapers, old white men who ran these institutions. There's a lot of resistance to the voices we can now hear that have always been there, but unheard thanks to things like black Twitter. And I think that's a lot of what's happening in the country right now is that voices not heard are now being heard and there is some resistance and a kind of counter-reformation to that. What I think we have to do is get past this first stage of concentrating on the bad stuff, right? The Vatican issued its index of forbidden books, which by the way, created a lot of bestsellers over the years, and it tried to tamp (laughs) down bad speech. And the Pope banned Luther and burned his books. And the first reflex is to go after the bad stuff. But then it turns it around and you start going for the good stuff and trying to find it, discover it, create it, support it. That's what the institutions of editing and publishing have done. And that's what we need to create today. So I think that the attention, especially since the election in 2016, has been so much on disinformation and fake news and propaganda. And fine, we should concentrate on that. We should try to deal with it, but we're never going to get rid of it all how much more productive it would be to instead concentrate on finding fascinating, interesting, authoritative, educated, relevant voices out there with different experiences of the world. And that's what we have to create now. And those are the big, I think, business opportunities as well around social media and the internet. Rather than just having a one-size-fits-all algorithm from Twitter or Facebook, look at what's happening on Blue Sky and Mastodon, where I think there's the opportunity to have more customized views of social. Um, I I think that we also have to get past the idea that this is about technology. Technology needs, we need, and it's going to be required, but but the technology shouldn't be running this anymore. I think it should be people who have an uh, experience in the humanities, in anthropology and Uh, the languages and philosophy and ethics and sociology and so on. When we start to shift our attention away from the machine to the people, that's when interesting and good things can occur. Uh, This former classics major thanks you. (laughs) (laughs) I knew you had a good education, Scott. (laughs) Much better than mine. Well, uh, it's only in recent years that I've uh, found it to be paying off. It was it was a long term investment. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but but this is fascinating to me because you know we're, we're moving from content to conversation, and you think about you know how much the internet has created this wonderful publishing mechanism for pretty much anyone who has access to Wi Fi. Um, and, and I guess the concern is, is there too much conversation out there to be able to uh, uh, create some kind of filter here and really pull out what's important to people? Because here's the thing. When I was growing up and when, when you were younger, we basically had three choices in major television network programming. Well, four if you include PBS. But Johnny Carson and The Tonight Show was the show that – over half of America watched uh, every single night. And now with TikTok and YouTube and all of these uh, federated uh, places, people have their own unique experiences. What's, What's uniting us anymore? I think that idea of the grand unity of media was a myth. Uh, It was born of the likes Mm. of Walter Cronkite who, when he said, and that's the way it is, did not speak for many, many Americans, for whom it wasn't the way it was. If you were black or or Latino or an immigrant or gay or um, disabled, you often didn't see yourself in mass media. Hmm. You know, what struck me most in in doing the research for this book um, 
was, number one, how conversational media were in the early days, right? Martin Luther and the Pope conversed through their books and burnings of them. Um, uh, Sir Thomas More and Erasmus literally conversed in their books with each other. Print was incredibly conversational until the mechanization and industrialization of print in the 1800s with steam-powered presses and linotypes and pulp paper and the penny, the penny newspaper and so on. And that's when also came the new business model for media. When a, a magazine publisher in the, in the late 19th century uh, discovered that he could sell a magazine at a loss and profit from the advertising. Thus was created the attention economy and the mass market and the idea of the mass. And the idea of the mass has always been an insult. It is a way not to listen to people, not to hear people, to just categorize them. So I, I think that that's what we have to train ourselves out of now is this idea of mass and scale and that everyone's the same and we're not. And it's a much more complicated world. It's a world with much more nuance and many more voices. Uh, but I don't think we were ever as unified as mass media wanted to believe that we were. And they had to do that because they had to sell their product and say, this widget will be good for everybody and you all must buy it because it's, it's the best. But I have on my desk a directory of newspapers in New York in the year 1900, there were scores and scores of them. We were not so unified behind one media outlet then. That's what television did to us. And we have to break free of that now. I, I think that's a, a really, really astute observation. Um, you even think back to the, the primacy of newspapers, which you know the, I think the, the coffee house gave rise to. Uh, where there was one newspaper that somebody brought to the coffee house and they read it to everyone. This was a small group gathering, right? And there were there were scores of coffee houses around London, in particular, to start. And um, eventually, they uh, you know they they saw the the need to you know create more of a, a centralized kind of approach. But as you say, it's an artifice. It's not actually what's been happening. We've really. Uh, I, we've been talking to each other in small groups, one to one, etc., since time immemorial, and it, it seems like we're just getting back to that, and we're having to extricate ourselves from the uh, artificial comfort of mass media that we've had for so many years. Well, well said, well said. I think it was an artificial comfort, and and yes, I love the coffee houses of London. Um, the publishers there saw the coffee house as their distribution mechanism. Um, the coffee houses resented having to buy the newspapers. They were going to start their own newspapers to compete. There was this classic uh, content versus distribution fight. And um, one of the, uh, of the of the major publishers, Addison and Steele, created uh, boxes, one with a lion's head, where people could submit things for publication through the lion's mouth. Well, that sounds like Facebook and Twitter, right? Um <laughs> What, what, one stat that really struck me, Scott, is that before the mechanization and industrialization of print in the mid-1800s, mid the average circulation of a daily newspaper in the United States was 4,000. It was a good-sized podcast or substack newsletter, right? And that was the scale at which conversation and influence occurred. And then it became huge in a way that had never been, before been imagined between the combination of mechanized print and broadcast. Hmm. Um, but that's not the forever. That's not the norm necessarily. That's part of what we're saying about this idea of the parenthesis is that we can go back and recapture some of the knowledge from before with what we've learned in the meantime. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, Gutenberg actually, his, his invention and what came from it actually was the antithesis of how humans consume information. I know, um, you know, as we've gotten... You know, to this age where you know everything's at our fingertips, there's so much uh, information being flooded at us every day, both by humans and by AI. I want to talk about AI in a minute, but a uh, there was a, a respected physician who did a a research paper on this, a guy by the name of Conrad Gessner, and uh, he was uh, he, he his concern is about this uh, flood of information being uh, confusing. 
uh, potentially harmful to people, uh, that information overload could actually overwhelm people. He wrote about it in one of his five books. And um, he, he, the thing is, this guy, uh, Dr. Gessner, has never owned a computer, doesn't have an email account. Um, he, he doesn't have access to the Internet because Conrad Gessner published Bibliotheca Universalis in 1545. <laughs> well done. Well played, Scott. So, it, you know, again, we're, we're grappling with the same thing that we always have. And Gessner was, you know, 100 years after Gutenberg, railing against the printed uh, book. He could be supplanted right now and, and railing against, uh, you know, this glut of online information. You're here because you're interested in personal development and professional development, I would say, as well. And many people, as they seek to develop themselves professionally, seek out MBAs. Well, MBA programs can be expensive. And as you know, the financial investment can take years to recoup. And it means taking time away from your job. That results in a loss of income and stalls your career progression in the shorter term. Well, there's an answer to that now with Augment. Augment is an online alternative MBA that's taught by founders of Wikipedia, Shazam, Waze, YouTube, and more. There's hundreds of students who are already using the lessons of this program to take the next step in their careers. It's 100% self-paced. You get a certification signed by the founder of Shazam when you've completed it. And the curriculum along the way is what you would find in some of the best business schools. Business and strategy, marketing, innovation, entrepreneurship, leadership, management, and more. As you know, I'm a big proponent of lifelong learning and when you learn from people who have been there and done that, you're getting information that is relevant and information you can trust. I'd like you to check them out at augment.org where you can get your alternative MBA for 50% off the regular program fees. All you have to do is go to augment.org and use the code Monty Scholarship, all one word, Monty Scholarship at augment.org. Isn't it time for you to take the next step in your career without breaking the bank? So I promised uh, to talk about AI just uh, recently. Google, <laughs> and I know you saw this, Google announced that it will be using AI for journalism purposes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of know what you're going to say, Jeff, but I want to hear you say it. Well, you know, so I'm, I'm a nerd, and I wrote a fanboy book about Google, and I'm fascinated with technology. Uh, and I think that the news business and publishing business were way behind in not experimenting with it sufficiently and not understanding the import and implications of it. Having said that, I'm surprisingly very cautious about AI and news. Um, large language models are fascinating, but I think they're primarily, a, in this context, a parlor trick right now. Oh, gee, it can make sentences like us. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and that's fine. Um, and I'm fascinated that, that it commodifies content. Right? This idea that we in journalism and media thought that our value was in a commodity we call content, which is a Gutenberg-era notion, I think was wrong. Uh, our value should have been, in journalism especially, in service and relationships and authority and trust and helping people improve their lives. Stories and content and text and media are just one tool that we have. And now here comes along AI, which says, oh, I can make you no end of this. And it commodifies us yet more. It shows us that this idea of the writer is not so special as we thought. A lot of people on earth are, are intimidated by writing. You know, you and I have made a living at it. Um, uh, but now we have a tool that can help people tell their stories and illustrate their stories. And I think that extends literacy in fascinating ways. But to use these tools to just turn out, to churn out more content 
um, in the journalistic context, I think is a dire mistake. Number one, because it commodifies what we do yet more. Number two, more importantly, it can't deal with facts. And we know this. I, I, I don't know if you saw the story, I presume you did, of the poor schmuck lawyer who used ChatGPT for his court filing <laughs> in federal court. <laughs> I went and covered his show cause hearing, why he should or should not be censured by the court. And it was fascinating. One of the lawyer's lawyers, and if you're a lawyer hiring lawyers, you know you're in trouble. One of the lawyer's lawyers uh, told the judge, well, I'm so glad you're showing the world the dangers of ChatGPT. And the judge said, whoa, I didn't set out to do that. And the problems in this, in this case were not technology at all. The, the lawyer used it in the first place to find um, cases that would back up his argument because he wasn't a federal lawyer. He didn't know what he was doing. And then the opposing counsel and the judge both said, we can't find these cases. And rather than, I don't know, Googling them and finding out what he could do, he doubled down. He went back to ChatGPT and he said, Is, are these cases real? Well, if you have to ask, bud. And then he had the ChatGPT produce the cases and it was gibberish that he obviously didn't read. And wow. the judge said, the problem was not your mistake in the first place. That's when the story began. That is to say that all the, the, the succeeding errors were human errors. And we see places, you know, I have friends at Go Media who are using AI right now, produce content at CNET, they've used it, and it's not working out so well so far because we know this. What large language models do is merely predict the next possible likely word in a sequence. It has no sense of fact. Now, I don't know what Google is doing with this Project Genesis. The New York Times called me for a quote, and of course I gave him a quote because I'll talk about anything, but um, I haven't seen it yet. And I, I'm going to Google next week by chance, and I hope I'll see something then. There are many imaginable uses for AI in the news context. Um, Project Tailwind, which is what I'm going to see, now called, I think, Notebook LM, uh, they hired uh, Stephen Johnson, a really well-known author, to come work at Google to help them make this. And you could, and, and what they said at Google I/O is that the AI could take a file you have on Google Docs and help summarize it, or organize it, or uh, point out things about it. That kind of augmented intelligence, I think, can be really useful. I, I talked to a B two B publisher not long ago who wanted to know how to use it because his bosses were on him. How do we use AI? And one suggestion I had was you've got a flood of press releases. Have it summarize them. See if it does a good job of using that in a, in a defined set of data. Um, as I said, I see using it to expand literacy. I talked to the Marshall Project, which covers uh, criminal justice, and uh, a lot of their audience is illiterate. Um, and they want to hear, and sources are illiterate, and they want to hear stories from people. Imagine using AI once again to help someone tell their own story and their own power, which they will check. So I think there are lots of uses, and I'm curious what Google is looking at. What they're saying is they want to do things that will help the journalist, not replace the journalist. And if that's the case, then it's worth experimenting with. Yeah, and I, I think that's just it. I mean, it, it's an enabling technology right now. And right. obviously, all of these uh, platforms, all of these AI tools are only going to get better. Uh, we've This is the first iteration. We're in 1480, as you said. Um, but let me, let me ask you, Scott, if I may, because I'm yeah. curious, um, you know, I, I heard from an, I, 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 um, moderated a panel at, uh, Berylsman's, uh, investment arm a few weeks ago, uh, with, uh, uh, media ad people and somebody from the ad industry said, we're being very cautious about AI because, uh, we're using it to, to brainstorm. We're using it to do mock-ups. We're using it to do other things, but we're not going to put anything out public from it. Uh, because we're afraid that there'll be copyright fights in the future. I wonder in your world, in the communications world, where people are seeing legitimate uses, where you're seeing stupid uses, and where you think it should be used. <laughs> well, to me, Jeff, uh, this is a lot like social media was to communications in the early uh, 2010s or so. Um, it, it simply amplifies bad behavior. <laughs> um, at this point, okay, yeah. Hum well human nature being what it is, uh, right. you know, when you get a tool that you think is going to help you become more efficient and, and will help you do things at scale, which is what advertisers and communicators always want. Um, it's just a matter of amplifying the poor behavior that's already in place. I, underlying, uh, you, you really have to change the underlying behavior first. And I think that's the crux of what 
you and right. I have been talking about here is how do we actually extract ourselves from this existing world of mass media and think in terms of what the future holds and quite frankly to define the future um uh, is is a press release something that's even going to matter in the future i don't know right, uh, I, right. I see so many poor pitches coming my way in email from people that simply don't do their homework of looking on my website or reading my newsletter and, and doing a little bit of heavy lifting before they actually lift a finger to the keyboard. So um, that's my fear right now. What about um, customer service? Um, well, I think we've already seen AI work uh -huh. in customer service. You're most likely talking with a chat bot online before they even hook you to a, an actual human being. And I guarantee you that on the, on the uh, customer service representative end, when you actually are talking to a human being, that there are probably real-time scripts and real-time uh, voice recognition technology that is helping them respond in the best possible way. So it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Yeah, it will be. I guess well, the, the concern I have as a classics major as somebody who is interested in ethics, philosophy, etc., comes from um, actually another philosopher you quoted in your book, uh, David Weinberger, where he, he said that uh, machine learning is just one of the many tools and strategies that have been increasingly bringing us face-to-face -face with the incomprehensible intricacy of our everyday world. And, and you yourself said, I see a rug being pulled out from under our understanding of the world, a crisis of cognition. So when it comes to the future of uh, publishing, of information, conversation, etc., this danger of AI and our reliance on it, do you really see that there is a danger of us not thinking for ourselves enough anymore? Um, no, I don't think that's what it is. I think that what I argue, David, David Weinberger is a brilliant philosopher and has a, one, a whole bunch of wonderful books. The, the one I quote from is called Everyday Chaos. It's his latest. And I pair it with a book uh, called how, uh, what history gets, how History Gets Things Wrong. And David brilliantly describes how AI and machine learning work, right? It's, it's, it, it does it by probabilities. Uh, it looks at a huge amount of data and then guesses what's next. And it can do that very well. And it's doing that in medicine. It's doing that in uh, business. It's doing that in all kinds of areas. But the problem is that it doesn't know why. It doesn't explain. Um, it just predicts. And we have kind of a human myth that we can explain the world, that we know what happens. Um, and to some extent, if the machine can predict better than we can, but we don't know why that's happening, that, that's what pulls the rug out from underneath us. That's what makes us say, oh, hell, I, maybe we don't know how the world operates. And, uh, you know, Darwin took away from us the idea that there was a... a God-given course in how life worked. Uh, at least that's the way I look at the world. Um, Newton took away some of it uh, from as the universe. And now computers take it away at a human level where things may happen that happen for reasons, but we don't know what they are. One thing that David says in his book is that an accident isn't really an accident. It's just something too complex to explain. And um, I, I, I think it's, going to give us headaches in the future that people are going to be frustrated and they're going to think that the machine is mysterious or this is what happens too, right? Things are, are from sorcery. We make up explanations for things when we don't have them. <laughs> and, and so the machine is going to predict things well, but no explanations will follow. And can we get used to that? What it also tells us is that the world is more nuanced and chaotic than we have admitted. And, in terms of media, we in journalism think that stories have neat beginnings and ends. The point of the book is the container and the cover, the alpha and the omega. Well, that's not true, right? Blogs in the web are more true to nature, which is they have no beginning and no end, and they flow forever. And, and you link around in a, not at all in a linear path. That's truer to the reality of life, but that's really hard to get our heads around. 
and it's frustrating. And so that's where I think there's a crisis of cognition is that people are going to get angry about that. Well, I think it's, it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a fair assumption. And um, I mean, as you were describing that, it just brought me right back to uh, the classic story in Judeo-Christian uh, mythology or, or uh, storytelling, and that is uh, Adam and Eve. And when suddenly the veil was lifted from their eyes, they realized they were naked and uh, God cast them out of the world, gave them free will, etc. Before that, there was no beginning. They just were. They had no cognition as to what the right. real world was all about. Right. Um, so again, we're we're just seeing this this uh, human nature being played out again and again. Oh, well, uh, the book, the Gutenberg Parenthesis, the Age of Print and its Lessons for the Age of the Internet by Jeff Jarvis. Uh, Jeff, this is still available as a print book, as far as I know, right? <laughs> yes, there, there is some, I, I acknowledge the irony there. Um, <laughs> uh, but at the end of this book, as I say, I, I say that we should let the book be the book. And, and I honor the form, and I honor Gutenberg. And I, 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 there, there is not a moment in this book when I uh, am, the, am the, the nerd and the geek um, uh, railing against the past. Quite the contrary. I think that, that the point is to look at what we have learned in more than a half a millennium of print society and its presumptions for our lives and the value it has had. I found this great quote at the I put at the very beginning from Mark Twain, who ah. um, was writing a, a piece for the alleged 500th birthday of Johannes Gutenberg. And so he wanted to look back, and he said, Gutenberg's achievement created a new and wonderful earth, but at the same time also a new hell. During the past 500 years, Gutenberg's invention has supplied both earth and hell with new occurrences, new wonders, and new phases. And at the end, he says that, that this colossal innovation has brought about, as uh, the, the bad that it has brought about is overshadowed a thousand times by the good with which mankind has been favored. I think that's true print. We had to get through a reformation, a counter-reformation, a 30 years war, all kinds of problems ever since, but we figured it out and we bought great benefit from print. And I think we will do, I think we have to have enough faith in ourselves that we will do the same with the internet and data and a connected world, but there are no guarantees. We can screw this up. We do screw it up to some extent and we have a responsibility to make good choices. And the way to make good choices, you and I, as fans of history agree, is to look back at the lessons we've learned in the past to help us make these decisions in the future. Love it. Love it, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, conversation. I feel like we could probably do this all day long, but uh, we're busy. Our listeners are busy, and uh, we just want to put a cap on this as the container of a podcast will do. So thank you so much for being with us here on Timeless Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. It's so great to talk with you again. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jeff. We'll follow up next week with a related commentary from me. And in the meantime, you can check out any of the links, certainly to Jeff's book and more at TimelessTimely.com and in the show notes. If you have any feedback or would like to ask questions, feel free to email us at TimelessPod at ScottMonte.com. As you spend your time in the week ahead in conversations, whether they're in person or digital, just a reminder that as a leader, you have an opportunity to learn more, dream more, do more, and become more. Our theme music is Americana Aspiring by Kevin McLeod. If you have the opportunity, leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Scott Monty. Thanks, and I'll see you on the internet.